Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. So I believe in both client science and water sustainability issues are a crucial thing for our generation and for generations to come. But what I really believe is that solar energy has the power to transform our state from a health perspective, from an economic development perspective, and has huge opportunities for the state of Georgia if we could just put the sun to work. So when I started to learn about the amazing things that are happening in the solar in industry across the country, and I started to look at the state of Georgia and figure out why are things not taking off here, I decided to learn as much as I could about the issue and what some of the issues are. And so today I'd like to share a little bit about what I learned with you so that you can be informed um, and help me put the sun to work for our state. This is the original Bell Labs solar panel in Americus, Georgia from 1955. So we were on a path forward. We were on the right path years ago. How did we lose our way? Can you imagine where we would be today had we continued forward with that research and development and that work? Can you imagine where we would be today? So 1955 kind of seems like a long time ago, but if you really put that into context, so that's 60 years ago, 1903, the Wright brothers' first flight, they struggled for years to get a plane off the ground for 12 seconds, 120 feet. 60 years later, we are landing on the moon. Dragon X, which is a, a SpaceX capsule, is now flying back and forth to the International Space Station with solar panel wings, and you and I are almost landing on the moon. We are this close to space tourism, and this is just 40 years later. So why? if after all this time, the solar energy account for less than 1% of total US electricity production, and in the state of Georgia, it is less than one-tenth of 1%. One Why? Why is that? In order for the US to maintain our world leadership position in innovation, job creation and investment opportunity, we have got to maximize domestic energy production. And one of the myths that's been out there is, well, we just don't have the right sun here in Georgia. <laughs> really, as recently as, as November, a colleague that I was working with um, that is, is someone who's not a solar advocate necessarily was using that line. So this is a map from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, that shows the world leader in installed solar capacity, Germany, gets the same amount of sun on average per day as the sunny state of Alaska. <laughs> Here is Georgia. At 214 days of good sun, so we're not saying that the sun is going to you know, meet our energy needs 24-7, 365, you have cloud issues, et cetera, et cetera. We get the same amount of sun per day as sunny Spain. So to say we don't have the right sun is just not true. What are the consequences of Georgians not capitalizing on this opportunity, and there are many. So let's look at a few of them. There are impacts on our state's financial health. Georgia spends $30 billion a year, billion with a B, to purchase petroleum, energy from other states. We spend one billion on natural gas, and between two and three billion on coal. The 30 and the one primarily goes to Texas. This goes to Kentucky and Wyoming. So there are financial consequences for our state for not capitalizing on our state's solar potential. There are health consequences. This is Plant Shear, which is 60 miles southeast of Atlanta. It is the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the country. It is the only coal plant to make the world's list of the 25 worst emitters. It's currently under investigation from the Environmental Protection Division for coal ash pond leaching, and the residents in Juliet, Georgia, 60 miles away from here right now, are coming down with the most bizarre combination of illnesses. So you have a man that's never had a drop to drink in his life, got kidney disease, then sclerosis of the liver, now he's had his gallbladder removed. So, you know, could be just me, but um, there are health consequences for not capitalizing on our state solar potential. 
There are resource consequences. Did you know that 50% of Georgia's water is used for electricity production? We heard earlier that 10% um, international water is used for industry in Georgia. It's 50%. So we're all seeing what's playing out right now at the Supreme Court with Oklahoma and Texas fighting over water resources. Georgia has been in a battle with Alabama and Florida for almost two decades fighting over water because it's an economic development issue. You can't continue to grow your economy if you don't have water. And that's what it is for Texas and Oklahoma as well. So we can continue to use 50% of our water to produce electricity, or we can look at things a different way. Okay, I have to apologize in advance if you are from the state of Texas because I plan to mess with you. Um, <laughs> do you know why Texas doesn't have a state income tax credit? Remember the numbers from earlier, 31 billion? We pay it for them. Do you know why our economic development agencies here at the state, the Metro Atlanta Chamber, the Georgia Department of Economic Development, cannot compete with the incentives that Texas is able to offer? Because we are sending all of our money to Texas to buy dirty old fossil fuels, and they are recruiting all the new clean tech manufacturing jobs. This is true. 2010, Texas had the un lowest unemployment rate in the nation. Texas, for the ninth consecutive year, rates as the top state for exports. They are recruiting the solar panel manufacturing jobs, the wind turbine manufacturing jobs. There are over 8,000 pieces in a wind turbine. Every single one of those could be made in the state of Georgia. If Texas were a nation, it would be the world's 11th largest economy. So we can continue to give all our money to Texas, or we can make some smart decisions here in Georgia to make sure that the money stays in the state. So to put that number earlier in perspective, that $33 billion that flows out of the state every year never comes back, the annual budget to run our entire state is $19 billion. There are national security consequences. We all know um, we have lost thousands of American lives protecting oil for people who don't particularly care for us. Um, so I long for the day that not another drop of American blood is shed protecting fossil fuels. So what can we do about it? So we've looked at what are the consequences and what can we do about it? So I think we can put the sun to work for Georgia. We can harness the power of the sun. The sun is the single greatest renewable resource that we have as a country. It puts 10,000 times the amount of energy onto the earth than we even consume as humans. Solar energy, um, the sun shines every day. We can take as much as we want. Think about it as we may pay a little bit more now for eternal admission into the Ryan's all-you-can-eat buffet. Because <laughs> once, you, once you install a system, and the warranties are good depending on the manufacturer, for between 20 and 40 years, requiring no water, not affecting our health. So we have got to do something. Americans overwhelmingly want us to do something. 91% of Americans support exploring renewables and increasing domestic energy production as being a priority for the president and for Congress. And this isn't just a left thing or white thing. This is 91% of Americans. So more than 9 out of 10 of you in this room would support additional domestic energy production. The market wants us to do something. If we look at how the prices of solar equipment has come down, and it's primarily a factor of the fact that the Chinese subsidize their solar manufacturing market, so it's not a great thing for American manufacturers, but what it has done is continue to drive the prices down to make the systems that much more cost competitive, that much quicker. So the prices just since Q1 2011 alone have come down another 50%. So big businesses are doing solar. Um, the top 20 corporate solar users, many of us have heard of a little company called IKEA. This is actually the IKEA at Atlantic Station. The, it's got a megawatt installed on the roof. The IKEA at the Savannah Distribution Center is actually the single largest um, solar project installed in the state, which is a megawatt and a half. Walmart is the number one user of solar in the US. They have huge facilities. Some of them have to operate 24-7, 365, so they have huge energy needs. And for many of these businesses, it's not necessarily an environmental sustainability ploy, it's a tax strategy. So even though um, you may or may not be a fan of subsidies, there's a 
income tax credit that expires at the end of 2016, so time is ticking. I mean, we've, we've got to get busy now, but that means 30% of the cost of installing this project is essentially, you know, written off as a tax issue. So um, Macy's, Costco, Johnson & Johnson, GM, McGraw-Hill, top users of solar in the U.S. The economy is doing something, so most people don't even recognize or realize that more than 119,000 people currently work in the solar industry today. So the number for coal mining, 83,000, that number continues to decline based on the fact that as EPA regulations go up on coal, the cost to operate those facilities also goes up, and so they're continuing to shut those plants down. 88,000 in iron and steel manufacturing. So this is a real business, and this doesn't even account for, that's the solar panel manufacturing jobs, that's sales, that's development, that isn't even the jobs that are accounted for from the concrete company that has to create additional concrete for the utility solar project. Nationwide, more Americans work in the solar industry than in coal. Um, the jobs are high-quality jobs. They're civil engineer jobs, electrical engineer jobs, they're local jobs, because 75% of solar employment is actually associated with local installation and development. So they're good, high-quality jobs. And the solar industry grew during the recession 10 times faster than the general economy and continued to grow even despite the recession. So. Why is Georgia missing the boat? Why are we behind New Jersey? <laughs> I, I, honest to God, we are behind New Jersey. And Chris Christie, who was a conservative governor, Chris Christie made an active decision that he didn't look at it as an environmental sustainability issue for a state, it's an economic development issue. So we have 130 businesses here in the state of Georgia that have to go to New Jersey to work. Come on. What's holding us back? Unclear and outdated policies. So solar was not specifically considered when the majority of our policies were written back in the 70s. People had gallbladder surgery back in 1970. Would you have the same surgery with the same technology that was available today? Probably not. Um, Seatbelt laws, if you think about it, are a little more than 40 years old. Who in their right mind, I have two kids, five and 10, would put their you know, five-year-old in the back window of an Oldsmobile and said, let's go, Johnny. I mean, you just wouldn't do it. Upfront costs. So here's something that's important for you to understand and consider. Um, the typical residential solar system, depending on the size of your roof, how much energy you consume, ranges between twenty dollars and $30,000. And so as a family, you know, your priority might be saving for college. Your priority might be you need to get a new car. You might have health care bills. Solar is probably not in your top five lists of expenditures that you're building for in your annual budget. However, the free competitive market has actually come up with a way, it's the free market, to finance these projects at little to no upfront cost, and that's called a third-party power purchase agreement. So the way that a third-party PPA actually works is I would ask you, hey, what's your monthly power bill? And we'll just use round numbers. And you say, oh, it's about $100. And I say, okay, well, how about this? Solar City, which is the largest residential solar company in the U.S., the same way you can walk into a Home Depot and order your granite countertops, you can walk into a Home Depot and order your solar system. Um, Solar City would say, your annual uh, monthly bill is $100. Let's do this. We'll install a solar system on your roof. I'll own it. I'll license it. I'll maintain it. And in, in trade, we'll get your power bill from $100 down to $20, and you'll pay me $50 for the lease. That's a third-party PPA. And the way they work is you can either do it via lease or be, via measuring the energy that you consume and paying per kilowatt. So this is a free market approach to financing these projects. That doesn't involve the government at all. If we look at the amount of money that is spent on keeping the entrenched interests and the status quo, we've talked a little bit about the status quo today and about the impacts of doing nothing, but I mean, these are numbers just from 2011. So the people that, that you know, are in charge right now don't really want the game to be changed because it's, it's going pretty well for them. So what I say is the rules of the game are designed to keep the Model T running versus buying the Tesla. It's time for a new game. No more status quo. What does that mean for Georgia? 
29 states plus DC plus two territories have what's called a renewable portfolio standard, which is where they set forth a goal that says we're going to have 30% renewables by 2030. If you look at the map in the southeast, what is going on? I mean, we, we've got plenty of sun. What is going on? Numerous federal groups have identified you will never have a national energy policy without the southeast. You will never have the southeast without Georgia. And where Georgia goes, the rest of the nation could follow. So we could literally be the game changer. I think we are the game changer. It's just going to take a little bit of work and help to get there. So one of my favorite quotes is, what is a conservative but one who conserves? I am a conservative, and I am supporting 25% by 2025. Who said it? Ronald Reagan, 1984. The 25% by 2025 was his version of a federal energy policy. Basically, I support 25% renewables you know, for our electric uh, generation by 2025. So every US president, going all the way back to Richard Nixon, has basically delivered the exact same stump speech. Literally, they probably pull it out of whatever drawer it's stashed in the, in the White House, dust it off, change a couple of the pronouns, and say, freedom from foreign oil, energy independence, we've got to get off of dirty foreign fuel, national security. Obama gave it two years ago during the Gulf oil spill. So it's not really working out so well for us right now. We've got to do something. So we started in Americas, and I'd like to show you, this is an ad that ran during the Bell Lab solar test, where the family is literally looking at the solar panel saying, ooh, it's shiny and creates electricity. And this one, I like this, this photo, um, because to me, it's God saying, take it, my child. It is yours forever. You can use all you want. I will still let it shine. So why are we not doing something? We have got to do something. What can you do? Currently, at the Public Service Commission, they are going through what they go through every three years with the utility, where they have to present their integrated resource plan, IRP, for how they're going to meet their customers' needs for the next 20 years. There are five Public Service Commissioners. You have the ability to pick up the phone, ask for a meeting, meet with your PSC representative, or all of them, say, I want a renewable portfolio standard for the state of Georgia, at a minimum. That's at a minimum. And it happens every three years. So that is currently going on. And I ask you, we cannot wait another 20 years, not tomorrow, today. Solar energy is transforming the US energy economy, putting Americans to work in all 50 states, and achieving record market growth. So I ask you to join me. This I believe. Thank you.